book of Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to pick up um, where we left off. And um, if you missed last week, I want to encourage you to make sure you have been paying attention to that and go download the podcast to hear and connect and be so you can be in tune with what God is going. I'm going to read verses 7 all the way through 14, and then we'll talk through that this morning so that God can move and have his way. If you're there, say amen. amen. Let us read. It says here, and the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf. They have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, he said, Let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountain and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offsprings as the stars of the heaven and all that land that I have promised I will give to your offspring that they may inherit it forever. And the Lord relented. Come on, say the Lord relented. Lord. Say it like you mean it. Say the Lord relented. From the disaster that he had spoken to bring uh, on his people, to bring on his people. Let's look to God for a word of prayer, and then we're going to allow God to move and have his way. Turn to your neighbor and say, do, do me before we pray. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. don't tempt God <laughs> with your disobedience. Yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah. Oh, that's a typo. That should be Exodus, yeah. Thank you all. Amen. Amen. That should be Exodus. Don't pay attention to that. Amen. <laughs> That should be Exodus. Were you guys in Genesis? Were you? Amen. Technical people make me look good and fix that before second service. Amen. (laughs) Yeah, amen. Exodus chapter 32. Turn turn to the other neighbor and say, other neighbor. neighbor. Don't tempt God God. with your disobedience. disobedience. Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, rain down. Holy Spirit, Move in this place so we can hear from you, God. We need a fresh anointing, a fresh anointing. We need your presence and we need you here, God. So have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Just by way of review, let me back up um, to Exodus. I got that, we got that right. Good. Um, When we started Exodus chapter 32, we've been dealing with this series for a few weeks now. And the thing that we shared with you, looking at verses 1 through 6 of Exodus chapter 32, is that when there's delays in hearing from God, it causes us to abandon the true form of worship. And let me talk to you what I mean by that, just to bring you up to speed so we can get to today's lesson. What Exodus 32 says is that when the people saw, go there with me, look at what it says here. It says, when the people saw, verse 1, that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, The people gathered together themselves to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And verse 4 says, So Aaron said to them, um, Take off your rings and the gold that are in your ears and your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. And as the story would have it, Aaron crafted this golden calf, and the people ended up worshiping this golden calf. Now, the thing I want us to look at, just by way of backdrop before we kind of move into the message for today, what was it about the people of God that made them wanted to have these gods that can go before them? And what I shared with you last week was three things. Number one, 
there was still a strong sense of idolatry um, amongst the people. And don't be so hard on them because this is what I've been saying. They had only been out of Egypt for a few months. Come on, say amen. Only for a few months they'd been out of Egypt, so they hadn't quite yet assimilated. So idolatry was part of their DNA. And here's what I said, um, I think it was a couple of Wednesdays ago. For some of us, we've been saved a long time. Come on, y'all. And, and we, still, we still struggle. We still struggle. It's been a long time and we still struggle, but idolatry was new to them. And more importantly, Moses' absence was so closely associated with Yahweh's presence. If you were to read, um, I think it's chapter 20, you will notice that the people were afraid to talk to God because for 400 years in Egypt, they worshipped or idolized these pagan deities or images that did not, never spoke to them. And all of a sudden, Moses comes as a God representative and Moses says to them, what God says, and then the, God delivers them from Egypt, and then in chapter 20, God comes down himself, and they now have an opportunity to hear God speak. For the first time in their life, they heard God speak. So they were afraid, and they didn't want to hear from him, so Moses now becomes their representative. He becomes their God presence. He becomes the person who tells them what God would have them to say. So now Moses leaves and Moses disappears. And Moses spends 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. And because he has been gone so long, it was in that moment of waiting that the people got impatient. And here's what I said to you last week. It's in the wait that, that I get impatient. Oh, don't act like you got it together like that. Come on, y'all should have hollered, me too, preacher. Come on, y'all. Can, can I get some honest Christians this morning, y'all? Can, can I get some honest Christians? It's in the wait that my golden calf surfaces. It's in the wait that I mess up. It's in the wait when, when, when God seems silent and I can't seem to be hearing from God. So here's what they did. They, they, they saw how God spoke through Moses. I'm going to say this and I'm going to move on. And so what they wanted to do was they got Aaron to, cra Aaron to craft this golden calf. And they got Aaron to perform this priesthood rite in hope that the God now would inhabit this calf and this thing would become the thing through which God would speak to them. But does anybody in here know that God doesn't want nothing to replace him? Amen. Any, come on, say amen. Don't fool me, y'all. Does anybody in here know that God doesn't want anything to replace him? Amen. I'm praying that I'm not too long this morning, but as we go forth in the text this morning, I want to share three things with you as we look at this test. The first thing, I want you to understand with me that God wants a nation of worshipers that is committed to him and him alone. Repeat after me. Say, God wants a nation of worshipers that is committed to him and him alone. So here's what's happening. When we get to Exodus chapter 32, we jump down to verse 7 now. The whole time this calf incident is going down at the bottom or the base of Mount Sinai, God is up on the mountain engaging Moses, and Moses has no idea what is going down beneath him because Moses is not omnipresent. Moses is not omniscient. He doesn't know anything. But what I found striking about verse 7 as we kind of walk through the text is that the whole time, verses 7 through 10, the whole time, God is up in the mountain. He is giving Moses his direct word, but at the same time, he can see at the base of the mountain. Come on, y'all, because some of us have fooled ourselves into thinking we can go places that God can't see us. Yeah, the whole time, he can see what's happening at the base of the mountain, and, and, and he tells Moses midstream. It's as if he's talking to Moses. He's issuing these commands, and here's what he says to Moses. Moses, something is going on down in the mountain. So I need you, Moses, to kind of, these are intentional words. Leave my presence for a while and go down and address what's happening in the valley. Now, this is where I really want to go to work because I want you to see something. Here's what you need to understand. Anybody remember with me from Exodus chapter 20 that God is a jealous God? 
Come on, say amen if you remember that. Here's what he says in Exodus chapter 20. I'm a jealous God. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make any graven image. Come on, you all know it. You all know it quite well. So when you read this text, it's as if God puts on this jealous mode because the people that he's married to are cheating on him. I'm using intentional words. And so notice this. Look with me now at at chapter chapter 32, verse 7, right? Look at what it says. It says here, and the Lord God says to Moses, Moses, and notice the words that he uses because God now deflects where in the past they were his people. But listen to this. There he's in jealous mode. He's in jealous mode. So notice how he speaks to Moses, right? And understand the omniscience of God because listen to what chapter 32, the first few verses says. They made a golden calf to replace Moses, they said, who brought them out of Egypt. So here's God. All right, you did it? Okay. Okay. So watch what he says. And the Lord said, go down for, I love this pronoun, your people whom you brought up, I wish y'all could see the visual. It's as if God is talking to Moses and then God's pouting. Them your people whom you brought out. Come on, I want y'all to see this. It's not like he's smiling and not like he's happy. Oh, Moses, those are yours. No, you've got to see an attitude. You've got to see angry. Come on. You've got to see a God that's now changed his demeanor. And and what's striking about his demeanor changing, he was in the middle of releasing his word over his people and something happens. Oh, my gosh. Your people, Moses, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, Watch what he says. They have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. And they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And and now they're saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. They stubborn. They hard head. I I want you to hear attitude here. And, And it's like this. It's like God saying this. God is saying this. Moses, I need you to go to your people. Because they can't possibly be mine. Because if they were mine, they wouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. Moses, let me help you understand the difference between my people and your people. You see, my people hang out in my presence just like you're doing, Moses. But your people don't spend time in my presence. The moment they feel as if I'm not there, they turn their backs on me and they do all this crazy, I wish I had somebody. So Moses, they can't possibly be mine because mine don't do that. So Moses, they must belong to you. Here's something I want you all to get. The, The reason this is so convicting for me Is because I call myself a child of God. I wish I had somebody. And and I know you call yourself a child of God. But there's times in my life when I find myself, and, and please notice the window that I'm giving you. When God seems silent, I forget, I forget whose I am and who I belong to. And I end up following the Moseses of my life. I wish y'all would stop acting like it's just me. Because here's what's happened when you're sitting at home with Moses on the screen. <laughs> when you're sitting in front of the computer with Moses. Come on, y'all. And we're following the ways of man And following the ways of God, I'm saying this for a reason, yet and still we call ourselves children of God. 
Listen to the first thing. God is looking for a nation of worshipers. And you need to hear me say to you this morning that whenever we find ourselves doing things that are not the way God wants them to be God to have happened, we force God to have an attitude with us. I'm going to get here. And it's almost as if he disowns us. Can't possibly be mine because mine don't act like that. You ever had a child? <laughs> Y'all know. You get that call from the school principal. Your child sitting right there. This is you. Oh, you sure can't be mine. Because mine don't act. Can you blame God? Come on, y'all. I'm going to teach you how my children act, and you ready to take them home and light them up. But we use the same words when the behaviors aren't right because being image bearers, we too act like God sometimes. Painting a picture. God's looking for a nation of worshipers, right? So notice what the text says. Jump down to verse 10. Jump down to verse 10. So notice what he says. Therefore, he says, I'm lo- let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you, right? Important stuff, important stuff. I want to I slow down here just for a little while. Say, say it again. Say, God wants me, God wants me to, worship to worship him in purity. In purity. One more time. Say, God wants me, God wants me to, worship to worship him in purity. Now, I know you didn't come to hear this this morning, but I'm going to say this. So whatever it is that's distracting you from God, stop it. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, just stop it. Come tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, just stop it. Now, watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. When God's people defy his word, it tempts him to renege on his promises Over their life. I got to slow down because I want y'all to get this. I need to slow down. Y'all in the house, say, say, we're here, preacher. Say it again, say, we're here, preacher. Now, the Israelites are down in the valley. And they're making, they've made this graven image. They're worshiping it. God says to Moses, he is so angry. He is so upset. Let me use a human term. He is so frustrated with the people, right? Now, listen to what he says. Moses, they're yours. Look at verse 10. Get out of my face, Moses. I'm about to kill them all, paraphrasing. And I'm going to start a new nation that looks like you. Say it again. Get out of my face, Moses. Leave me alone. How many times do you hear God saying that, right? That my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you. Now, on the surface, you don't get what that's, what's happening here. So let me go deep with you for a little while. In Genesis chapter 22, I mean chapter 12, verse 2. God made a covenant with Abraham. Here's what he said. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless your descendant. I'm going to multiply your seed. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So leave your home. Go to a place that I'm going to show you. Genesis chapter 12. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac comes on the scene. And God repeats the promise that he made with Abraham to Isaac. Here's what I said about your daddy. I'm going to bless him. I'm going to bless his descendants. Isaac has a son by the name of Israel or Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. And God repeats the promise. Understand with me now, Joseph is a descendant of that lineage. Understand with me that Israel's 12 children, sons, became the children of... Come on, y'all. Come on. Understand with me that when Joseph went to Egypt, it was just his immediate family with his daddy. And after 400 years, they had become a nation, right? So understand with me, the whole premise of the Exodus 
was God going and get his people whom he promised he was going to bless and multiply their seed and take them now to this promised land called Canaan. Are you with me? Now, these people have so ticked God off that God is saying, I'm done with all y'all. Forget what I said. Forget the promise I made to your daddy. This is heavy. Forget the promise that I made to Abraham. Forget the promise that I made to Isaac. Forget the promise that I made to Jacob or Israel. I'm going to kill all y'all, Moses, because lock into this. My people are in my presence worshiping me. They must be yours, and they're down there. So I'm going to create a new nation that looks just like you. I'm going to kill them all. My gosh. You mean, you mean sin has that grave impact? That it could cause, it could tempt God to renege on his promise? Oh my gosh. And we take that so lightly. We take it so lightly. We forget the fact that God is looking for a holy people. God is looking for a righteous people. God is looking for a people that's committed to him. Does this make sense? I want you to see the depth. Now, now, don't fool yourself into thinking that God is a God that's going to defy his word. I just want you to see the depth of what the authors are communicating to us and the position we put God in when we disobey him. It makes him think. It's almost as if God says, maybe I made a mistake with Derek. Maybe I made a mistake with Felix. Because he should be at my feet, not at the base of Sinai making golden calves. I wish I had somebody here. He should be in my presence, not over here running the streets of Colfax, doing what he had no business. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on now. Maybe he should be, he should be at my feet. He shouldn't be. All over this place, surfing the internet, looking at stuff he or she has no business doing. Maybe I made a mistake because they should have changed by now. And it's as if God's saying, after all, I am God. I can do whatever I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. So Moses, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to kill them all. Because you do remember I did that with Noah at one point. So I can do it again. Come on now. Don't, don't, don't get it twisted. <laughs> I can start, yeah. I can start over if I want to. And they're going to look like you this time around. I don't know about you, but I want you all to see this real quick. Because here's, here's this. He to unleashes anger. He was so angry, his angry birds against them. He wanted to destroy the current Israel. And look at this. He wanted to make a new nation out of Moses. Now hear this. God's commitment to his word is the only saving grace that keeps us in covenant with him. I, I expected a shout. I expected an amen. I expected a hallelujah. Come on, y'all. I expected something a little different. Because when you look at the text, right, here is what Moses did. And we're going to read this, right? Moses then appealed to God on three arguments. Here's what Moses did that I probably would not have done. God says, Moses, I'm going to kill them all, and I'm going to make a nation out of you. And I'd be like this, really? And get rid of Abraham? And my name is going to be great? And you're going to bless me instead of them? Okay. And don't act like you wouldn't have done the same thing. Come on, y'all. Don't act. Notice what Moses did. He kept God honest to his own word. Oh, my gosh. God, why should you nullify the result of your demonstration of divine power. Look at what the text says. Let's read, let's read, let's read, let's read. Look at what he says, verse 11. But Moses implored the Lord his God. Come on, say he implored. 
Say it again. He implored. Here's what he says. Oh, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt? Watch this. With great power and with what? Um, here's what Moses said. Hold up, God. Hold up. Hold up, God. Don't forget what you did for them. I get the fact that you're mad, but don't forget what you did, right? And, 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 and what I love about that is because I know God gets mad with me, but I thank, you, I thank him that is with his mighty power that he delivered me. With his mighty power, he delivered you. And sometimes you've got to remind God of what he did. Notice the second thing he said. Notice the second thing he said. He says, why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent you brought them out to kill them? in this mountain, and to consume them from the face of the earth. Wow. And then he says, turn from your anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Now, here's a shout. Okay, God, remember Abraham? Remember Isaac and Israel? Watch this. Servants to whom you what? Swore by your own, yeah, not by man. I'm going to go here, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go here. By your own self, and you said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I promise I will give to your offspring, that they may inherit it forever. Here's what's going on. It's like Moses says to God, hey, God, I could see if you were human, You can change your mind, and you can do that. But you released the word, and you said this is what you were going to do. And Isaiah wasn't written yet, but Moses prophetically says, as the dew falls, the rains fall from the heaven, and it doesn't return before it waters the ground, so is the word that comes from your mouth. It cannot return to you void until... It accomplishes what you set it to do. So guess what? If you kill them and you wipe them out and you start over with me and you said you were going to do something, you can't be God. Oh, y'all missing. The... <laughs> excuse, me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. God's commitment to his word is the only saving grace that keeps us in covenant with him. Right? Here's what that says. Before the foundations of the world, I knew you. I formed you. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. So here's what that means. God destines you before we even showed up. And as much as he wants to kill us when we mess up, it is nothing but his his grace that says I should take you out. But because of what I said, oh, Jesus, 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 it's not what you did. Because of what I said, I'm going to stay true to my word. So listen, y'all, I'm alive today because of God's word, not my behavior. I wish I had somebody in here. I'm alive today because of God's word. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody went to God and said, God, this is what you said. The overdose didn't kill you because of his word. The car accident didn't kill you because of his word. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on now. That pregnancy didn't take you out because of his word. He released it. And it can't go back until. Ah. Ah. I know I don't deserve to be alive. I've acted worse than those Israelites. Oh, don't act like you haven't done it. Oh, don't act like you've always been holy and always been righteous. Don't make that mistake. His word. It's like God's got a major tude. I ought to take you out. 
But you better be glad I formed you before the foundations. And my word is the only thing that presses me to keep loving you when you're not acting right. My word is the only thing that keeps me in covenant relationship with you. So lock into this. And I'm done. The text says, he relented. He relented. He relented. He relented, right? Here's that Hebrew word, relent. Naham. To be in a condition of finding a measure of relief from sorrow and distress and to be consoled and encouraged. Watch this. Watch this. I'm mad in this moment, but because I'm omniscient, I can see 20 years from now, you're going to get it together. And because time doesn't matter to me, I exist in time and out of time. I can step 20 years from now and I can rejoice in the freedom I wish I had somebody, the deliverance, the healing, because I'm mad now, but I'm in the now, I'm in the there at the same time. And I can console myself that my word will come true. I hope you're getting this. Because current actions upset God. Future changes encourages him. Do you get that? And he's not only in the present. He's in the future at the same time. I told y'all he was on the mountain talking to Moses. But he was in the valley. At the, I wish I had somebody here. At the same time, while he was talking to Moses. So what we see, what I see, what you see is not the end of what God sees. So he graces us. He loves us. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I say all day long, Lord, thank you for your grace. Because one hymn, this one songwriter said, please be patient with me. Because God is not, tr yeah, you get it. But when God gets through with me, come on, y'all. What you see today is not what I was 10 years ago. It's not what I was 20 years ago. And God was patient enough with me. This is why he can grace the Israelites in their failings. Now, I'm done. Sin does not go unpunished. He didn't destroy them, but he still released a plague. So hear me. Grace does not mean no consequences. <laughs> Why is I'm still broke? God forgave me. Why the baby had to be born? God forgave me. Why do I have to go through this? Grace does not mean escape from consequences. There is still the plague of life. But in the plague, he is with us. In the plague, come on, y'all. He's walking with us. Here's what I want y'all to hear me say if I have a big idea. You are here today because somebody what? In case you're wondering who that somebody is, Romans 8 and 26 puts it this way. The Holy Spirit makes intercessions for us with groans and utterings when we don't know how we ought to pray or what we ought to pray for. So while I'm building that golden calf, the Holy Spirit says, Lord, forgive him. It's going to be, I wish I had somebody in here. It's going to be all right. While I am messing up, the Holy Spirit, like Moses, is my intercessor, reminding God of his word over my life. I'm done, but hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. He wants pure worshipers. He wants me to get it right. So here's what I need to do, because here's what happens. Here it is. Obedience, disobedience, delays blessing. Because I got to go through the plague before I'm blessed. So it would be my best interest to stop it now. So I can end the plague and receive. I wish I had somebody in here. 
Moses ought to kill him. No, God, this is what you said. And, 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 and I'm done, but watch this. This is the only thing that's keeping us. His commitment to his word is the only saving grace that keeps us in covenant. Stand to your feet this morning. Come on, worship team. Here's what I want us to do this morning. I want every person in here to take a moment and open your mouth and thank God for his grace. Come on, come on, thank him. Come on, thank him, thank him. Open your mouth. Come on, come on, come on. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Come on, and thank him for his grace. Thank him for his grace. If it means you got to raise your hand and you got to say, God, I was at the base of Sinai. I was doing the crazy stuff. I was messing up, but you kept me. I tell you, when God released this word in my spirit this week, I was in my office at home. I had no choice but to get on my face before the Lord. And I said, God, but your grace, but your love, but your kindness, but your mercy, nobody but you. As the Spirit is moving in this place, if you are grateful today for what God did, and God is saying to you, come and repent, come and make it right, come and celebrate God. If you haven't given your heart to God, these men and women are here to, to receive you. Come, come this morning. If you just need to come and kneel at this altar, you come this morning. Let God speak. Don't, don't act like you've been all that. I'm telling you, when God dropped this in my spirit, I had to leave computer. I had to leave Bible. I had to leave books. And I had to get on my face before the Lord because I did not deserve his grace. Because he didn't see me as I was. He saw me in the future. And more importantly, here's what salvation did. He saw his blood covering me. Lord, have mercy. If God is speaking to you this morning, let him be God. Come on, in your own way, go to him. In your own way, go to him. Let him speak. Let him speak. Come on, open your mouth. Just thank him. Just thank him. Just thank him. Just thank him. Let God move this morning.